Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual discussion with Red Butte Garden and uh, guest artists McKenna Powell, Missy Ames, and Kylie Gardner to talk about our newest Celebration of the Hand public art exhibition entitled Planting for Pollinators. I'm going to start us off by talking uh, a little bit about some housekeeping rules. Um, so for the purposes of this discussion, please keep your microphone on mute um, so that everybody's able to hear the presentation. Um, captions can be turned on at the bottom of the screen using the live transcripts option if you so choose. Um, and we highly encourage questions. This is supposed to be an interactive discussion. So uh, if you have a question at any time during the session, please feel free to type it in the chat. We're going to address your questions at the end of the presentation, including the questions that y'all have submitted in the pre-registration process. Um, and then we'll be posting a link to a survey about the event in the chat at the end of our discussion. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So first, a little bit about Craft Lake City. Um, who are we and what is our mission? Um, so Craft Lake City is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based out of downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, we were founded in 2009. Our mission is to educate, promote, and inspire local artisans while elevating the creative culture of the Utah arts community through science, technology, and art. And I am so excited for today's discussion because I feel like this exhibition really does bridge art and science together. Um, some of the things that Craft Lake City is up to throughout the year, um, we are most known for our DIY Fest, uh, which is our flagship event. Um, this year, the 15th annual Craft Lake City DIY Festival presented by Harmons is set to take place at the Utah State Fair Park on August 11th, 12th, and 13th. This is the largest local-centric arts, science, music, and technology festival in the entire state of Utah. It is a three-day event. It is just a huge celebration of all things local and handmade, and it is wonderful. And I hope that everyone in attendance here uh, or viewing later the recording of this session uh, will make it out to the DIY Fest. Um, we also do a holiday market. Um, this year, we're going to be hosting the fifth annual Craft Lake City Holiday Market. Uh, this takes place up in Ogden, um, December 1st and 2nd. So that first weekend of December, and this is a two-day event. It's a great chance to get all your holiday shopping done under one roof while supporting small local makers. Craft Lake City also hosts a ton of DIY workshops all throughout the year. Um, that shakes out to be almost one per week on average. We do 50 plus workshops uh, every calendar year. Uh, classes include all sorts of great different types of topics, including things like printmaking, lettering, bookbinding, and so much more. These are taught by local artisans, uh, oftentimes first time instructors, giving local makers a chance to try their hand at teaching and develop those skills. Um, so if you're interested in our workshops, you can check those out at craftlakecity.com workshop workshops for more info and tickets. And curation projects. This is what we're here to talk about today. Um, if you've ever walked along Broadway 300 South in downtown Salt Lake City, you may have noticed these metal frames kind of scattered throughout a few block radius. We actually are in charge of programming the art that is up there and uh, which changes seasonally. We have kind of two branches here, Celebration of the Hand, which is um, work created by local artists. Um, and Local Voices, which is us partnering with other local organizations, usually nonprofits, to share their mission statements and their programming up, up in these frames. And they change every season. So today we're here to talk about the newest exhibition, which just went up a couple of days ago, which is uh, inspired by spring and pollination. And we have three wonderful guest artists here to talk about the work that they've done for this project. Um, so first we have McKenna Powell. Uh, McKenna, are you on the call? Are you ready to say hi? Hi, my name's McKenna. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Thank um, you. McKenna Powell's artwork includes symbolic figures and plants, or symbiotic figures and plants, excuse me, um, and often convey uh, symbolic elements about death, regrowth, and the changing landscape. McKenna holds a love for nature and believes society should coexist and not be above it. A beautiful, beautiful work here, and can't wait to talk more about the piece that you did for this exhibition. Um, next, we have Missy Ames. Missy, are you on the call? Hi. Awesome. Nice hey, Missy. Thanks for being here. Um, Missy Ames is an artist and designer living in the Rocky Mountains. Her work follows the themes of travel and nature, and she loves to experiment with painting methods and technology to capture different styles. 
very, very lovely work and can't wait to talk more about your climate for pollinators piece. And lastly, from our artists on the call, we have Kylie Gardner. Kylie, are you here? Hi, I'm Kylie. Thanks for being here, Kylie. Yeah. Um, Kylie Amber, born 1997, is from Orem, Utah, where she is currently based. Her subject matter consists of elements from nature to explore the energy of the earth and how it can help connect us to things we can't understand. Very lovely work. And yeah, we're so glad that you were part of this exhibition. All right, and now to introduce Red Butte Garden and their team. They have a wonderful presentation for us to talk about the STEM component of this exhibition. We have Johnny and Jasmine here from Red Butte. Thanks so much for joining. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having us. Mm. So my name is Johnny Gonzalez and at Red Butte Garden, I'm a scientist and educator. My background focuses on ecology and entomology. So hi. And hello, I'm Jasmine. I'm the adult program manager here at Red Butte Garden. So I coordinate all of our adult workshops and classes, and we're actually working on a workshop here with Craft Lake City that will hopefully be open for registration this spring. Yes, we are so excited about these ongoing partnerships, and thank you so much for being here and for all the hard work that you've put into this exhibition. Um, so I'm going to be ru running through these slides, so just let me know um, as you're ready to move on, but I'm going to hand the microphone over to you all to talk about pollination. Awesome, cool. So with our next slide, please, uh, let's talk about pollinators. What are they, right? So at the simplest point, they're something, an animal, that carries pollen from a male part of one flower to another, simply put. So compared to the wind, which might be pollinating trees, for example, um, a lot of photos here are from the garden and from our awesome volunteers or a curator. These are just a few of the many pollinators we have and that we're going to go through. So here you'll find bumblebees, uh, bumble beetles, <laughs> flower beetles sometimes also called, or a lot of hummingbirds, hummingbirds, which are starting to appear again. It's pretty awesome. Next slide, please. And a shout out to our other pollinators. A lot of people don't think about flies or wasps, but they are very frequent and common pollinators, including mosquitoes. I know they get a bad rap, but they're pollinators too, at least for the males. Um, usually you'll find that the females are feeding off of blood, but the male ones will be pollinating. And we have a variety of these different types of insects. There's so many different pollinators, we don't have enough time to talk about them all, but we're going to get a little overview about them, their evolution, some facts about them, and how we can support them. Next slide, please. So I think an important part about understanding pollinators today, you have to understand evolution and some biology, looking back just a little bit. So one thing that surprises people is that a lot of these insect groups were already on earth and had evolved before a lot of flowering plants. So take a moment to just grasp that fact because it's it's wild. Even before our first flowering plant that we can think of, Archifructus, which is like 140 million years ago, there were still already bees, different flies, different things that were the beginnings of pollinators. And we see that they might have had a connection to um, wind pollinated plants like trees. So I think that's an important fact to just soak in for a second, which it, it's astounding, right? When you see a pollinator today, it helps us understand that long history because it tells us ways we can support them now. Um, next slide, please. So in case you're wondering, um, here's some quick, quick facts about flowers and just plants in general today. So there are over 180,000 plants that rely on those pollinators to reproduce. And if you think about your meal and your food, it's likely that three out of your four bites are going to be a crop that relies on pollinators, which, again, that's a big thing. I love ice cream. I love chocolate. <laughs> so I give a shout out to these pollinators. And you think about your ecosystem and what helps keep them healthy. It's a large part, both plants and pollinators. Uh, you think about plants that are stabilizing your soils, supporting wildlife. It, at its base root, will go down to a plant and its pollinator. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about our bees and our bee situation, because those are some of our biggest pollinators here in Utah. There are over 
1,100 native bees in Utah, which is nuts. And that's actually about a quarter of the U.S.'s native bee population. So a quarter of the U.S.'s bees can be found just in Utah, which is nuts, right? And even further interesting than that is um, here at the garden, we actually have about a tenth of that that you can find here at the garden. One scientist um, several years ago did a survey here at the garden to look for these different bees and found that there were about 127 of these bees here, which is one interesting, but also in Salt Lake County, there's only about 190-ish bees. So a lot of these bees were found at the garden and were very representative of what you can find in the county. Next slide, please. So I can't talk about bees without giving a shout out to this bee. This is the European honeybee. A lot of people think about this bee and it gets good press, it has good PR, which is fine. It's a good bee to have, but it's not the only bee. Um, think about those 1,100 bees we have in Utah. Those are native bees. This one, as the name suggests, from Europe, right? Uh, part of why it's important to understand that evolutionary history we're going to talk about next um, is because this bee, it's a great, you could say, Swiss army knife of bees. It will pollinate what's there. It's not going to, you know, distinguish between different meals. A lot of bees won't. A lot of pollinators won't distinguish but it's not very well adapted for some things like our next slide, please. So one native plant is the narrow leaf milkweed, which has you know, evolved in the Western United States for a long time. And part of its adaptations is it has very, very sticky pollinia. And for honeybees, they didn't evolve around that. So when they encounter it, sometimes they'll stick to it and just die. <laughs> so, Again, it's one of those things where you think about which bees do you want to support. You could have native plants like this milkweed. It will be great for things like monarch butterflies or certain beetles, and it might be detrimental to some other insects. So it's just an example of knowing evolution and understanding that history helps us pick the plants that are more ideal for pollinators today. Speaking of which, if we go to our next slide, please. Um, I get asked this question a lot of like, what should I plant for supporting pollinators? So one of the great resources I love is pollinator.org. So they have so many resources on how to support pollinators in general. And this is one of my favorites. Um, essentially, this gives you an idea of what certain pollinators are looking for. So for example, if you wanna support bees, you usually wanna go with bright white, yellow, bluish flowers. Um, a lot of insects don't have the best vision when it comes to the, the color red. So red flowers aren't as supportive of bees, but they will support, as you see here, birds. They'll support birds and butterflies. So um, it gives you a lot of options for what you would like around your home or the flowers you want or what you want to support. Um, this is a great resource just to think in general. Or maybe you're thinking, I want a fresh, mild, pleasant smell. <laughs> and what pollinators could you support with that? Um, this is one thing I'll refer back to a lot when I think about uh, the plants I want. Um, speaking of which, next slide, please. This has been the resource I go back to a lot, and we'll share it out in the end for sure. Um, from U USU's Extension Services, uh, they have essentially a planting guide for different genuses of bees. So um, those are those green boxes at the top there, Apis, Bombus, Halictus, Osmia. Um, for supporting those types of bees, these flowers are great for that. And not only that, this shows bloom time throughout the year, because one thing that's important is to feed these different pollinators throughout the year. Um, some bees you probably start to see in the next few weeks that are emerging quickly, and there are flowers that can specifically support them. And this goes all the way into September, which is awesome. And you see even then bumblebees will be out sometimes into November because uh, they are good at keeping themselves warm. So they're still looking for meals even as far as into October and November. Uh, this is something I've referred back to a lot. I can't stress that enough. Like even just thinking about what I want around me, the bloom times, the different color options with these different plants. I think this is one of my favorite and best resources I could share. Uh, next slide, please. And going with that resource, I made my own little pollinator garden last year. Um, so using a small space, it wasn't too big for this hexagon. Um, I did do it in the middle of summer, so it wasn't ideal to support some pollinators, but 
we'll see what it looks like this year. Um, going with that past resource, I picked a lot of plants that would support bees from about April to September. Um, not only that, I was getting picky with it, with the colors I want, different things. And even just subjectively, I can say I had a lot more bees and different types of pollinators visiting my home than I did previously. Um, I Sadly, it was, again, in the middle of summer, so I couldn't give you the best indicator of what that was like. Um, but what I can say is there were also flies, too. I hadn't noticed many flies visiting my flowers beforehand, but after this, I saw a lot more of those, too. So, yeah, it's it's an easy resource to follow once you get into it, and it can make a pretty nice-looking garden. Go to our next slide, please, and we'll talk more about what else bees need. So along with the foods, we think about what else a bee needs, right? A home. So we can think of how to support them with the habitats and the spaces we offer them. They have different needs. So with our first two photos in the top left, um, they are both like bee hotels, you might have heard. Um, these are the type that you can open and take out the tubes because um, if you do go the route of like looking for a bee hotel, um, I highly suggest it's one where you can remove the tubes yourself because they are prone to getting diseases or mites over enough years. So those are great for supporting your mason bees, your orchard bees. Um, you can even see they plug them with mud in that middle top photo. If you have twigs of like rose stems or even just... Um, Plants that have hollow tubes in their stems, you can leave some out and there will be different bees that will use those like in our top right photo here. One thing that is tricky for me to do in my own gardening is just leaving dirt spaces. <laughs> um, there are a lot of bees that dig. There are There's a whole group called the digger bees and they, as the name suggests, just dig. They're gonna dig, they're gonna lay their eggs and it's important to have dirt spaces for them. Um, I know that can be tricky for some, you want to cover up every patch you can, but they need a home too, so that's one way to support them. In the middle right, um, just like any bird bath or any other water source, bees and other things need water. So it can be as simple as like a small little bowl, putting water in it, maybe some pebbles so bees can land on them or butterflies. Um, with those, the only thing you should be mindful of is uh, just like bird baths, watching out for mosquito larvae which again, male mosquitoes will pollinate. So think about it how you will. Um, but yeah, leaving water out for them is a great way to support them, especially in our hot, hot summers. And then in the bottom right, going with um, the dirt again, mud. Mud is actually a source for water and salts for a lot of different butterflies. Um, I, I, I'll call them mud suckers sometimes. <laughs> They're they're just getting salts from it, and you might not have thought that till now, but it's a very handy resource for them. So yeah, these are some other things besides foods that you could have around your home to support different bees, um, keeping an eye on them. And like, it's fairly low maintenance, but it's an easy and effective way to support bees. Um, our next slide, please. So here's some more involved ways on how to support bees. And I want to mention, this is a general overview, I guess what I would say is do what makes sense for you and your home and your budget, your time, do what makes sense for you. This is just in general from an ecologist perspective, how you could support bees. So weeds come up a lot and even, okay, that's kind of a joke. <laughs> weeds come up a lot, get it? Um, around my own home, there are weeds coming up now. And it's always a topic of debate for me. Because dandelions, for example, those flowers are pretty good at supporting early spring pollinators that are out. So for me, I like to just let them flower, but not seed. So for me, I'll go pluck them after they're finished flowering. For other weeds, what I can say is um, avoid pesticides. I'm sure that's pretty familiar to a lot of people here. Just avoid pesticides because it can get in soil, it can get in plants, it can get in insects. There's a lot of different ways you can harm insects with pesticides. Um, landscape fabric. So thinking about our past slide, we can think about we're preventing that dirt access, right? There's a lot of insects that won't be able to reach that dirt that they rely on for a home. And in general, landscape fabric doesn't hold up very well for weeds over a long period of time. So that's something we tend to avoid at the garden as well. Turf grass. So that's its own conversation. But what I can say is that when you have just one type of turf, it's really not going to support a lot of diversity. You could think of it like if you had an ice cream shop, 
If you just had vanilla ice cream, you're only going to get the people that like vanilla visiting your shop. If you had a lot of different flavors of ice cream, you're going to get a lot of different people that love all sorts of flavors of ice cream. Same with turf grasses or lawns. If you only had a grass, it's really not going to attract much. But if you were able to find different alternatives like clover, um, there are different times that grow pretty well. Or even if you just wanted to change it out for plants in general, that's an option that could help support pollinators. And another issue that for sure comes up is like just being uncomfortable around insects. Um, I understand like if you don't necessarily want bees that have set up around your home, that that's kind of worrying, right? Um, there are definitely local groups that will remove honeybees that they love to take from you. Um, there are wasps that while they may be pollinators, maybe they're concerning to you. In general, a lot of people will confuse beneficial wasps for the bad wasps that sting us. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with them, I guess you can safely remove them or deter them, is what I would say. Yeah, so um, ending, our, ending with our last slide, uh, just some general resources. These are what I love to go to over and over. So from USU, they have so, so, so much on plants and insects and how to support pollinators. Extension.usu.edu, those are so great to go to. Pollinator.org, that one is a national group and they have a lot of different guides for different parts of the US. So it's not as specialized for Utah, for example, but it's great to get general overview information about pollinators and how to support them. And of course, come visit Redview. Come visit us during different times of the year, see what's blooming, see what's not blooming. You can get an idea of what might look good to you around your home. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, we can uh, save questions for the end, I suppose. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johnny, for this fabulous presentation. Very, very informative. And um, this plays in so much to these themes that we were going for with uh, this exhibition at large of just getting people thinking about pollinators, the pollination cycle, and also um, helping people maybe feel more empowered to be able to do something regardless of how much space they have access to uh, to put together a pollinator garden. So that's just wonderful. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to segue into looking at some of the beautiful artworks from the guest speakers that we have on the call with us today. Um, we have a few questions prepared for them. So we're going to start with McKenna. Um, absolutely stunning piece here, um, playing homage to the purple cone flower. Um, thank you so much for, for making this. Um, our first question um, is, what is your personal connection to pollinators and gardening? Yeah, so um, I feel like I've had a personal connection with nature in general my entire life. I'm born and raised in Ogden, and I have uh, I was fortunate to have two parents that they had a love and respect for nature and my mom had her garden and um, she was always like really difficult to buy presents for, for like birthdays and uh, Mother's Day. And I eventually learned that I could just buy her like perennial flowers and she could plant them in her garden. And, um, and she's no longer with us, but that garden, like there's lilies and columbines that still come up to this day. And for me, it's it's very symbolic and very meaningful that her, like her her work still lives on and and like a part of her still lives on with her garden and um, and it makes me want to kind of continue that and um, like to continue to plant flowers for her and um, and on my dad's side, you know, he took me hiking and camping from a very very young age, so I was just immersed in nature from the very beginning. And yeah, I, I just feel like I have like a huge, huge connection. We would go up to Monte Cristo and I would just wade through the wildflowers and like bumblebees would like be bumping into me. And I loved it. Like <laughs> it's my favorite thing ever. So yeah, um, I definitely have a strong, strong personal connection to like, to like the flowers and like the whole like scheme of of everything coexisting together and pollinators are huge in that for sure. So that is wonderful. I love the story about yeah, getting flowers for your mom. That's really lovely. Um, so I guess to kind of just provide a little bit of context as to how this exhibition was structured. So um, we featured 14 different local artists 
Um, each were invited to create a piece inspired by one of two specific flowering species. Um, so each person was given a choice between two options and then a list of pollinators that corresponded um, to those specific species. Um, and so uh, McKenna, you chose the purple cone flower um, and the bees to represent here in your work. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you the most about the plant and pollinator options? Um, and did you learn anything new about them uh, while creating this artwork? Yeah, so I, I've always, you know, seen the purple cone flower and I really like, I just love wildflowers. They're just make me so happy just to go hiking and, and to see like everything blooming and um and I learned that uh I, I kind of had like you know like some knowledge that oh like you know bees are 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 pollinators and everything and I learned specifically for the purple cone flower that leaf cutter bees and honey bees are kind of the main pollinators so yeah Wonderful. Thank you for that. And I just want to give another shout out to Red Butte Garden um, for helping us arrive at this um, scientifically accurate list of pairings of um, Utah friendly uh, flowering species that attract pollinators and the key pollinators that correspond. So beautiful work, McKenna. Thank you so much. Um, we will have some more questions at the end for the general Q&A. Um, for now, we're going to look at our next artwork. Um, and this was created by Missy Ames. Um, Missy depicted the firecracker penstemon, um, as well as a, a variety of pollinators in this piece, which is really, really lovely. Um, so Missy, what is your personal connection to gardening and pollinators? Um, I'm a new gardener, but I have really enjoyed it. I have, I bought a house a couple of years ago, and so I finally have a bit of land that I can shape in the way I want. So we're actually currently in the middle of taking out our lawn and planting um, just something a little bit more water wise than grass. So that's been a really fun process is learning about the different plants and trying to figure out how best to do it. Balancing my want to have like roses and like really thirsty plants and then also like native plants like what how to do that in a way that like satisfies all the different things that I want out of a garden. Anyway, this has been really a fun project. Um, I um, chose the firecracker penstemon because uh, I really liked the red. I knew which flower this was and I recognized it. And then um, we were given a color scheme and I thought that the red green would have a nice um, balance of values, like a nice pop because they're complementary colors. So. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun and I love hummingbirds. I have several feeders in my yard and they're always a favorite with my kids and you know, they're just so pretty and interesting. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. I chose the, the hummingbirds and then I also have, um, I can't remember the name of the moth, but it's a certain kind of moth and then some little bees. Wonderful. And it, it is really nice to see a variety of these pollinators represented because in a lot of cases, like we you know learned about before, uh, earlier in this presentation, different factors for various flowering species can attract a, a whole host of different pollinators. So this feels like a really joyous interaction here that you've got going on. And definitely the pop of color is really, really coming through. Um, was there anything new that you learned while working on this art project about pollination, about flowers, anything along those lines? Um it really just made me think a lot like I am planning out my plants for this year and it made me think about how to pair different plants together and and just keeping in mind the pollination. I mean, I am also going to be growing vegetables and so knowing that these pollinators will not only pollinate these flowers and be attracted to these flowers, but they'll also help me get better vegetables and bigger vegetables. It's kind of like a win-win situation. So I do something for them and then they do something for me. So mm. I, I, it's been interesting thinking about that and like how to position different things in my own garden. And anyway, it's fun. It's, it's cool to think about how these things all work together, all these different ecosystems. And then layer on top of that, like the water crisis and how, how to, you know, with climate change coming, what to plant in your garden is a really big question, I think. Um, how to do it in a way that's like sustainable and also forward thinking and 
trying to plan for like all but all the different scenarios that could happen in the next decade or so so I don't know it's it's just maybe given me a lot of food for thought so yeah I love to hear that I I totally hear you as far as the magical symbiosis goes I think that's just so wonderful that the the whole pollination cycle can create such a beautiful complex uh you know interaction between these natural species thank you so much missy next we're going to look at the beautiful artwork by kylie um kylie has depicted the cat mint here along with some hummingbirds and kylie i would love to hear from you what your connection is to gardening and pollination yeah so um it's really funny my last name's actually gardner um, and so it was just always a joke within my family growing up that we were the gardeners and like, for some reason, like we're all super into it. Um, I like, maybe it's the last name. I don't know. But, um, when I was younger, we had like this huge garden in our backyard and every Wednesday and Saturday, um, during the summer, my dad would have us get up and go out and weed like really early in the morning. And my siblings hated it, but I loved it. I loved just being like in the dirt, like seeing all the bugs that were like drawn into the garden, seeing the process of, you know, the plants, you know, going from a seed to something we like could cook, you know, like it was just such a cool experience. And then um, th they were also like super into like landscaping. So we would learn about the flowers that we could plant and like how that would make our house look, trees, like we did everything, you know? So I've always, always been, um, just like a part of the process of planting things and watching them grow. And I, I just love it. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and for this project, what inspired you the most about the options that you received um, for the different plant species and the list of pollinators? Yeah, How did that play into yeah the work that you created? Yeah. Um, when I was looking through the options, I knew like at first glance, I 100% wanted to do a hummingbird. I think they're like such a unique animal and I've always loved like watching them just like fly around They're they're just such a weird bird you know they look like an insect to me um and so I just like off the bat knew I was gonna do a hummingbird and so um I was looking through the hummingbirds and I saw this is the Costa's hummingbird and I just thought like that purple was just so beautiful and then um when I looked at the cat mint flower I saw that it was also purple and I was like perfect like that is gonna look so cool um, and then another reason I chose the cat mint is just because um, if you can tell there's like this reddish like leaves at the very top by the petals and I, I just thought that was like such a weird I just love how weird like plants can be um, like it's its own like kind of art you know like I don't even have to like paint it it's already art basically so I was just like this is going to be so cool um, so yeah that's kind of I kind of was just thinking about like how like I could make something look super cool and like fit together. And um, I just like, when I looked at the, the plan, I could just like envision it. So that's why I chose it. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, was there anything new that you learned while working on this project? Yeah, so when I was looking up like cat mint, um, obviously it sounds a lot like catnip. And I was like, what's the difference? Like am I, I was really nervous to accidentally depict catnip. Um, so basically, I'm pretty sure, I mean, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that catnip is a part of the catnip family. Um, so this is just a different plant in that family, and it doesn't give, it doesn't make cats loopy like uh, catnip does, um, I think. Um, anyway, so I learned that there's a difference between those, and then I learned that hummingbirds can fly backwards, and I'm pretty sure they're the only bird that can do that, um, and that was, and upside down, they can fly upside down, so. That was just a fun random fact about hummingbirds that I learned. So fascinating. Well, I <laughs> learned something new today. I learned a lot of new things today, but that was yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much, Kylie. Yeah. Let's look at our next piece. Um, so we have already talked about all the artworks from the guest speakers that we have on the call today. But as mentioned previously, there are a total of 14 works in this exhibition. 
Um, and we worked closely with Red Butte Garden to put together, um, again, those lists of flowering species that grow in Utah, as well as the key pollinators that accompany them. Um, and we offered up the options to the artists such that there wouldn't be any repeats in the designs. Um, so here up top, we have a beautiful piece by B. Colon, um, and this is the English lavender. And then down below, we have borage, also known as star flower, uh, made by Kimberly Johnson. Um, we've got some beautiful, vibrant sunflowers here up top um, by Vicki Lee. And then um, Jupiter's Beard. This artwork was by Denise Plant. And these are all local artisans again. Um, and then we have the Orange Cone Flower. Um, this was depicted by Autumn Jones. We have Garden Time by Lo Lomprey. The Blue Flax. This was by an artist named Jenny Lynn Kensley. And the Cosmos flower done by Lila Nuttall. We've got bee balm depicted by Tira and Jorian. Um, their business name is Fell. And then the butterfly weed, also known as milkweed. This was by Mallory Thurgood. So a big, big variety in styles here represented in this exhibition. Um, for anybody in the greater Salt Lake area, uh, Utah in general, um, we would highly encourage you to come and visit these works uh, in person. These are available on view 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, in downtown Salt Lake. Um, here we have a little map of where these are located, but if you're on Broadway, 300 South, between a two block radius of 200 West and Main Street, you can see all 14 pieces here. We have been uh, graced with some really wonderful weather the last couple of days. Um, so I would say take advantage of that and go and uh, smell the, the proverbial roses, if you will. Although we don't have roses featured in this exhibition, there are a lot of other wonderful flowers. Um, the goal here was, uh, well, a lot of goals with this exhibition, one of which though was to just transform the urban landscape here. Uh, this section of downtown, it is very, urban, industrial, um, a lot of like concrete and asphalt. So we have gone in and transformed it into a bounteous, colorful uh, spring garden. So this is where you can find all 14 pieces on Broadway. Um, the exhibition is going to be up until the end of April. Um, so we have um, like a month and a half to go check those out in person. So now it is time for question and answer. Um, we have a few questions that have been submitted in advance from um, people who pre-registered for the event. So I'm gonna take a look at those and get the discussion going. Um, first, we have a question for Johnny. Um, if there is one big takeaway for beginner gardeners that you could impart, um, what would be your best advice that you could give them? Well, um, I think, the things that stand out to me because I was a beginner gardener real recently is um, that there probably is a flower and plant that matches your needs. So whether your needs be, I want to support pollinators for me, for example, that's what I went with. Um, there are so many plants you can choose from, but even if you just wanted certain colors, maybe you wanted certain heights, um, it's really an artist's palette of what you want your garden to look like. And there's no shortage of how you can make it look, what you want to do and support with it. So I think just take the time to find all the different plants you want, visit different gardens, go to different um, plant sales. It's pretty exciting to just be among plants and think about what would look good in your home and around your home. Yeah, wonderful advice. Thank you. I'm re recalling the earlier days of me getting into gardening and um, just doing a lot of looking at what was growing uh, in the immediate area. And I found that to be really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, also, like you said, going to these like garden spaces, uh, Red Butte being one of them, um, to go check out what, what all is happening in Utah, the native flowering species, and seeing what you want to plant in your garden. Wonderful. Um, I have a question for the artists, so maybe we can go in order of appearance from the slideshow. Um, what did you find the most difficult and most rewarding about capturing the image of the flowers and pollinators in interaction? And so let's start with McKenna. Sure, yeah. So for me, it was probably scale. Um, like I wanted to capture the scale of the flowers as well as the scale of the honeybees, but also incorporate like a personification with like 
the the flowers growing out of her hair and everything. And also I am a traditional artist. And so I did this one digitally. So I have some experience, but it was kind of like, it's not like my forte. So it was a little bit challenging there, but yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Missy, how about you? What was particularly difficult and rewarding about this, this project? Um, I love being given some nice parameters. I'm a designer by trade, so I like being given, you know, what the objective of the piece is at the end, because that's where I'm comfortable is, you know, making um, information make sense to people. So it was fun to have a project where you gave us enough freedom to choose the flower and then the end piece itself, how we did it was totally up to us, which was really great. Um, but you also, you know, gave us like a structure. So it's like, here's the palette we would like you to, you know, stick around and then here is some flower choices and then go off and you eat like the, you give us the size. So it was fun because um, there's nothing more terrifying than just looking at a blank page and being like, what do I want to draw? <laughs> but then you, if you have the starting point and a place to work within, it um, becomes more of a challenge and it's really fun. So um, yeah, that part was really great. And then I've been experimenting a lot with reducing down um, artwork to it's like barest essentials. So if you're familiar with the artists like Charlie Harper or if there's um, Jay Fletcher, he's like a contemporary logo designer, they'll take animals and strip them down to like the most fundamental pieces of that creature. So you have exactly enough where you can tell what it's supposed to be, but not any additional detail. And it's a really, really difficult thing to accomplish. So um, I've been playing with that a lot. And so it was really fun to look at the flower and there's so much you could add with color and texture and size, and then trying to be like, nope, reduce it down, reduce it down. So I found it to be a, a fun exercise in reduction and abstraction. Anyway, it was yeah, great. That, that's really <laughs> fascinating. I do also want to point out, I mean, we, we did get to preview the 14 works all together, but one of the big criteria that we're looking for from a curatorial stance is bringing in artists who have not only a variety of styles, but also artistic media that they primarily work in. So for this exhibition, we have, I mean, the, the end result is a, a digital illustration across the board, but we brought in artists who specialize in painting, colored pencil, um, yeah, like graphic design, all sorts of different artistic media, which I think really translates into a, a dynamic collection. And I, I hope that everyone else feels the same way. <laughs> I It was so awesome to see all the different kinds of art. I loved all the pieces. I went down yesterday after work and walked through the streets and looked at everyone's work. And that was the most fun part about it is that we all started in the same place and came up with completely different things. And it's all on the same topic and they all hang together really when I nicely so that was really fun and uh congratulations to the other two artists on the call uh, your work is excellent i concur thank you missy um kylie i'd love to hear from you as far as um what you found challenging and rewarding about this project yeah so um i think the most challenging part for me was like the plant that i chose i knew it would probably be more effective if i had a lot of them in the piece, um, I just, I, it looks like a, like a meadow wild flower field sort of a thing. So I like really wanted to like have that, um, like kind of effect, but the challenging part was like layering the leaves on top of each other to where it didn't look like just like a blob of green at the very, like I wanted it to be interesting and like dynamic and have a lot of depth to it. Um, and it was, yeah, it was very difficult to like figure out how to do that without it like looking either like again too chaotic too muddled or like too like perfect and like calculated basically like I wanted it to flow really well um and then I feel like the texture like again I'm like I'm a I'm more of a um traditional artist too like I have a little bit of experience with digital so I was like I want to get a lot of texture so I played around with like brushes and stuff. And that's probably the most rewarding part is I, it felt like a very um, experimental piece for me, like learning about how to work with digital 
um, textures, digital colors. Like it was, it was very different, you know, but um, I thought it was just super fun to like play around with all of it. Um, and that was probably the most rewarding part for me. Mm, that's wonderful to hear. And yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting opportunity for a lot of the artists that we work with as we do these seasonally. So, you know, a few celebration of the hand exhibitions every year. Um, and oftentimes we do hear this, that um, artists who work in more traditional media generally have this be like, a you know, some somewhat of a steep learning curve as far as like adapting those skills and styles into a completely different format. Um, just executing the artistic vision, but also working in a really large scale. Um, these pieces, they are um, pedestrian level, um, but they're really, really big. They're four foot by eight foot. Um, I guess anybody here from the group, um, do you have any notes about your experiences working at such a large scale? If that's something that you've done before, if there was anything that you learned um, from that experience? I've done a lot of large scale in my work, but it was fun. I've never done anything from my iPad to this. So that that was interesting. I was very curious to see how the resolution would look mm -hmm. at that level. And it's not like making a billboard where you're comfortable with a lower resolution. It's like, it's right there. So I was very curious to see how it printed and um, pleased with the results. So interesting. Yeah, same here. I've like I've never actually uh, worked this large scale with like going from an, my iPad to have it print, you know, that large. I've done done like one like mural and like some bigger canvases around that size. So like it is a different experience because like we're working as if it's just a normal piece of paper, right? But then we know what's going to be blown up to this big size, um, and that just kind of like adds a little bit of. I don't know, pressure, <laughs> but you can't like hide things away, you know, but I thought it was a cool experience. Yeah, so I, I feel lucky that I have, so I have my surface, which ultimately couldn't handle it, um, but I did most of the work on, it's just like my, it's like a laptop um, tablet hybrid. And then I had to move it to a computer that has a little bit more power but I can't like physically draw on it because it's not a touch screen and so I was lucky that I at least was able to problem solve and figure it out and it was able to to pull it off with like just a little bit of playing around with technology so yeah. awesome and just to circle back to Craft Lake City's mission statement for a second so we we are all year round, all the time, trying to elevate Utah's creative culture through science, technology, and art. And I, I'm just so jazzed to hear, you know, some of your experiences utilizing technology and kind of working with it to achieve artwork on such a large scale, because that that is, you know, challenging. There is a learning curve there. There is for us too, getting things ready for print and everything. Um, but yeah, to take something so small and to be able to blow it up to a four by eight foot size and have it look really beautiful and crisp um, is, is really something magical. <laughs> um, our next question here, um, it's kind of for everybody. And I'd like to start with Johnny. Um, what projects are you working on right now? Whether that is an art project, whether that's something going on in the garden, a personal project, what, what all are you up to these days and excited about? Sure, so my role at the garden is um, I'm on our school programs team. And what I'm currently working on very much relates to this. It's um, it's called a botany bin, which is a resource for teachers to check out from the garden to have in their classroom for about three to four weeks. And this next one is going to be called Pollinators, which is all about pollinator neighbors, um, how flowers attract them, what they are, and how that impacts us. That is the big focus of this, and it's meant for second grade. Um, so it's, um, I guess I share a lot of similar challenges that some of you have in that, like I'm thinking about materials, how that will hold up over time, how children can interact with them, will they be interesting to children? Um, that's been a lot of my time recently. As a personal project, even um, our front yard, I've been thinking about the things that are going to grow there this season, what we're going to plant very soon, <laughs> and how that will impact pollinators around me. Um, like I said, I'm an entomologist, so I will be spending a lot of time both at home and at the garden, just catching insects, IDing them, seeing what's there, and 
I don't know, thinking about it, really thinking about if I'm having a positive impact. Super cool. Thank you, Johnny. Let's go to McKenna next. Yeah, so I, um, as I made a goal last year to do one big art piece a month. And so I kind of set myself for a goal and I, I finished one um, about a week ago, like right in time for a gallery show. And, and then so now I'm like, thinking about what I want to do for my next big project and kind of planning for the summer because it's I my art career has really taken off like the last two or three years and because I've invested in it and so I I'm just investing in in that and and continuing to do it and hopefully keep growing from here on out so yeah Wonderful. Can't wait to see what you come up with next for your big project uh, for the coming month. Um, let's go with Missy. Um, I'm working on some stickers for, um, I'm taking iconic Utah signs and turning them into like fun graphic stickers. So like the classic bowling sign or like the popcorn, there's like a bunch of weird signs, neon signs that when the coachman, there's like a coachman restaurant downtown that got closed and they have these really weird signs. And so they're, they might remove them permanently. And so when that happened, I thought, I want to make a bunch of stickers that are just weird Utah signs that they don't make anymore, like these neon handcrafted signs. Anyway, it's a personal project. <laughs> I don't know if it'll make it funny, but it'll be fun. That sounds so fun and wonderful. Thank you, Missy. Kylie, let's hear from you. What are you up to right now? Yeah, so um, I... Luckily, right now, I feel like I've gotten a lot of like the deadline work done that I've had this year, um, obviously this one and then a few of like other shows I was doing. And so right now I really I want to get back into kind of creating. I do a lot of watercolor landscapes and acrylic landscapes. I'm super inspired by like Pacific Northwest. Um, and so I kind of just want to start doing those on a like a larger scale than I have been doing. Um, which is a little bit intimidating, but I'm really excited. And then I have a few, I have the, I, yeah, I have a lot of um, large watercolor commissions that I have to start, which like I, I've never taken on such a large, like watercolor painting before. Like it's just bigger than I normally do. So I'm like looking forward to that and kind of dreading it because it's a, it's a big project. So, you know, just, just lots of random little things coming up prepping for Craft Lake City too. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing you at the DIY Fest and uh, yeah, good luck with the, the watercolor commissions. How Thank wonderful. You. Cool. Um, it looks like we have gone through all of the questions here. So we will segue to our thank yous. So um, Celebration of the Hand is a really big endeavor and we couldn't do it without the help of our wonderful supporters. So big shout outs to the Center for the Living City, the Temporary Museum of Permanent Change, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Salt Lake City Arts Council, the Zoo Arts and Parks, and of course, Red Butte Garden. Thank you so much for consulting on the STEM component of this exhibition. It is just wonderful and exciting to get to bridge art and STEM together in such a, a fun and seasonally appropriate way. Um, and we couldn't have done it without your help. So thank you so much. Um, big thank you to all the artists who joined us for the call today, McKenna, Missy, and Kylie. We're really, really honored to get to feature your work in this exhibition. You all did such a phenomenal job. And again, I cannot stress this enough. Anybody tuning in live or watching the recording later, go check these pieces out in person. Um, they are so magnificent um, in their grandiose large scale on the streets of Salt Lake City. Um, you can find more information about our programming and this exhibition at craftlakecity.com. Um, and again, Celebration of the Hand Planting for Pollinators is going to be up through the end of April. Um, so go check it out, bring a friend, bring some loved ones, family members, and um, yeah, get inspired by these 14 beautiful artworks and um, yeah, get curious about the pollination cycle and our local pollinators. Um, we're going to be posting a survey in the chat in just a moment. We would love to hear your feedback about the call today. 
Um, and yeah, stay tuned for more exciting seasonal exhibitions from us and all the stuff we talked about earlier from Craft Lake City. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you.